good day. Yesterday, in my last video, I said that it might be premature to say that the Battle of Donbass is coming to an end with the surrender of Ukrainian troops in the Azovstal steelworks in Mariupol and with the Russian advances in northern Donbass in Lugansk region. Today, I'm going to slightly revise that picture. As I'm going to discuss briefly, it does seem as if there are the first clear indications of a collapse of Ukrainian forces in Lugansk region, in northern Donbass. And it's possible that if this collapse does happen within the next few days or weeks, then we could see the whole of the defence in of, of the Ukrainian defence across Donbass crumble as well. I want to make it very clear that this is simply a feeling, a guess if you like. I don't have any definite evidence of this. Uh, well, I, there, there are some indications about it which I'm going to discuss in a moment, but I am not obviously a military person and of course any, any assessment by me of the military events on the ground, as I repeatedly say, has to be accepted with caution and scepticism on the part of anybody who's watching these programmes. So I, I make those qualifications right at the start. But let's first of all begin with what's going on in the Azov style steelworks. First of all, it is now universally acknowledged, even within the Western media, that what we are looking at at Azovstal is not an evacuation, it is an unconditional surrender. And um, the Ukrainian troops, many of whom belong obviously to the Azov regiment, are coming out and they are simply and straightforwardly surrendering to the Russians. And that is now what is happening and nobody any longer seriously disputes this. Zelensky continues to talk about efforts to negotiate the exchange of these people, but the Russians for the moment don't seem to be interested. So that's the first thing to say. As of style, the As of style saga has come to an end. The Battle of Mariupol has now definitely come to an end. The second point I want to make is that the total number of prisoners who've now uh, come out of the Azovstal steelworks, the number of Ukrainian soldiers who've left the Azovstal steelworks and who have surrendered to the Russians, now numbers over 1,700, according to Russian claims, which I have no doubt are true. Now, that combined with the Ukrainian troops elsewhere in Mariupol, at the Ilich factory and at other places who surrendered, the combined total of Ukrainian prisoners captured by the Russians in Mariupol totals somewhere in the region of 4,000. Now that is an important number because of course President Zelensky and Ukrainian officials have at various times claimed that the garrison, the Ukrainian garrison in Mariupol, which was trapped in Mariupol, numbered around three and a half thousand. Well, we can already see that the total number of prisoners that the Russians have taken exceed that number. So this figure of three and a half thousand that Zelensky and his officials have been claiming is clearly wrong. It is obviously untrue. Now, the third point I'm going to make is that a militia, a Donbass militia commander, Commander Hodakovsky, has been making some statements about the Ukrainian surrenders at the Azovstal steelworks. He says that of the 1,700 have now surrendered, which is, as I said, verifiably true. The Russians confirm it. And by the way, it seems as if um, the prisoners have been um, monitored by the International Committee of the Red Cross. I don't have any reason to doubt these numbers. Anyway, Khodorkovsky claims that this is half the number of troops 
who were in the steelworks. Or at least that is what I have understood Hodakovsky as saying. Now, it may be that this is a mistranslation or a misunderstanding of Hodakovsky's comments. It may be that Hodakovsky meant something completely different. It may be that Hodakovsky is just guessing and that he is completely wrong, even if I have understood him correctly. But if Hodakovsky is right, <clears throat> then the total number of Ukrainian troops who were holed up in the Azov-style steelworks was not 1,000, as has been speculated by various people, or 2,000, which tended to be the upper limit that others have speculated. It seems to have been at least in excess of 3,000, which is considerably more than the number that has been floating around, the numbers that have been floating around until recently. Now, this is very speculative. We don't know yet. We don't yet have a complete number for the number of troops, Ukrainian troops, hold up in the eyes of Stahl steelworks. Now, Hardokovsky has made some other claims, and they are very remarkable. And these I do treat with a very, very heavy dose of salt. He claims that the Russian and Donbass militia forces that were attacking um, Mariupol, that laid siege and captured Mariupol, and I want to stress these, of course, included Chechen uh, fighters from the Russian National Guard, uh, many of whom, of course, are volunteers. He, Khodakovsky claims that the total number of these forces, Russian militia and Chechen, were actually outnumbered by the Ukrainian defenders of Mariupol and were outnumbered by the Ukrainian defenders of Mariupol throughout the battle. Um, Khodakovsky actually says that the number of Ukrainian troops holed up in the Azov-style steelworks is actually greater than the number of troops, mainly militia troops, who have been surrounding the steelworks. Well, that's Khodakovsky's claim. I have no way of verifying it. I suspect that Khodakovsky is bragging. He's trying to make things out as if his uh, forces, the militia forces, have achieved a victory against, well, heavy odds. Just the kind of thing people do say. But I'm sceptical. What does seem to be true, however, is that even if Khodakovsky is wrong, even if the Russian and militia forces that captured um, Mariupol uh, were not outnumbered by the Ukrainian defenders, even if there were, in fact, more of them than there were of the Ukrainian defenders, then it still remains the case that the Russians and the Donbass militia do not appear to have outnum outnumbered the Ukrainian defenders by any very, very marked degree. Now, there's been much discussion about how many Russian and militia troops actually encircled Mariupol. Some put the figure at 50,000. I guesstimated it at between 30 and 40,000. But it's important to remember that many of these troops that were encircling Mariupol would not have been engaged in the actual fighting in Mariupol itself. They will have been positioned around the city to pre prevent any attempts by the uh, defenders of Mariupol either to break out or perhaps more importantly to prevent any Ukrainian counteroffensive of which many were promised to try to break into Mariupol and to break the siege there. So it seems that the actual assault forces that actually captured Mariupol may have been at least on the same order of magnitude as the defenders. Now, if that is correct, and again, one has to be extremely careful here because we still don't have proper and full numbers, then that would make the capture of Mariupol uh, a, a rather remarkable military operation because, of course, the Ukrainian defenders would have been defending 
um, an urban location with the large apartment buildings that are so typical of cities in the former Soviet Union being natural fortresses and of course the industrial plants around Mariupol also being um, essentially fortresses. Well, an attacking force that is able to capture a city um, defended in that, that way against uh, significant defenders, uh, well-entrenched defenders, has pulled off a considerable victory. And I would again repeat a point which I've made in previous programmes. Compare what happened in Mariupol with some of the other great sieges that we've seen in the Middle East, like the capture of Mosul from ISIS by the Iraqi army, or the capture of Raqqa in northern Syria from ISIS by a Kurdish force, in both cases backed by the United States. Uh, Raqqa, by the way, is a city in Syria, very similar in, in size, or at least in population terms, to Mariupol, though it's unlikely that it has these big, strong apartment buildings, as I said, so typical of Russian Soviet cities, which, as I said, are natural fortification areas. But anyway, the point is that those two sieges, Mosul and Raqqa, took months. The battle for Mariupol seems to have lasted, well, has lasted for a couple of weeks. And it does look as if the besieging forces were able to capture Mariupol remarkably fast against a very well entrenched defence force. Now that may be important in terms of future battles elsewhere in eastern Ukraine. It seems that when the Russians do put their mind to it to capture large urban locations, they know how to do it and they do it very effectively and very well. Now, that's what I wanted to say about Mariupol and Azovstal. Now, it seems that one of the Ukrainian commanders that we've been hearing so much about, Commander Kalina, he indeed has been, uh, he has indeed handed himself in. We've not heard about the other uh, well-known or publicly well-known Ukrainian commander, Commander Volin. He still seems to be um, in the bunkers at Azovstal. Um, some Ukrainian troops are still apparently holding out there. I'm not able to guess how many. Some suggest that, you know, it could be, well, Khodorkovsky says another 1,700, if you believe him. Others do put it lower than that. They suggest that it may be no more than 300. It is strange that they're coming out in dribs and drabs, that they're sort of emerging from the factory in this somewhat disorganised way. And that does rather reinforce my belief, by the way, that this has been an event not ordered by Kiev, but one which arose spontaneously as the Ukrainian troops, or at least the bulk of them, within the Azovstal factory, finally decided that they simply couldn't keep fighting and that they would come out and surrender. And I would add, by the way, that there are rumours, I can't confirm this, that what eventually caused this mass surrender, the single event that triggered this mass surrender, was that the Russian besiegers were finally able to disconnect the water supply and that the troops, the Ukrainian troops in the Azovstal steelworks have been running out of water. Well, that's a report, a rumour. Again, I cannot confirm it. What is indisputable is that this is an unconditional surrender. Now, I say that nobody, as I said, is pretending any longer that this is an evacuation, that this is something that 
uh, um, that there were some sort of terms agreed for this surrender. The Russians have made it very clear that as far as they're concerned, this is an unconditional surrender of the troops who were guarding the Azov-style steelworks. And um, all those earlier reports that they were being evacuated, presumably to Ukraine, um, all those reports based on claims that the Ukrainian government made, well, they have been exposed as total nonsense. Now, this haul of 4,000 prisoners that the Russians have taken in Mariupol, by the way, is the largest number of prisoners taken by any army that's fought in Ukraine since the start of the conflict in April 2014, when Ukraine launched its so-called anti-terrorist operation in Donbass. So this is a major defeat for the Ukrainian army. Now, events are not just, of course, limited to Mariupol. And the reason why I think that there's been clear signs now of some sort of imminent collapse in Donbass is that apparently there's reports that Ukrainian troops in the encircled city of Severodonetsk and it is apparently now encircled that some of them have been refusing to fight and that there are increasing reports of mass surrenders of Ukrainian troops taking place in this area. Now, I cannot confirm this. I don't know whether or not this is true, but if it is true, it would not surprise me. Right across this area of Donbass, we've been hearing more and more reports every, almost every hour of settlements, Ukrainian settlements, East Ukrainian settlements, falling under Russian or Allied control of the forces in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk becoming ever more isolated from the rest of the Ukrainian army, and in fact of Russian and militia forces having now penetrated deep into Severodonetsk itself. And, well, again, Full, complete confirmation of all of this is impossible. We're getting this from Russian sources, but there's increasing indications from Ukrainian accounts of what's going on in Donbass, of increasing recriminations, of anger on the part of various pro-Ukrainian or Ukrainian commentators, of feeling that the soldiers in Donbass have been let down, and incidentally, there's also reports that the Ukrainian military leadership in Kiev is becoming increasingly exasperated by President Zelensky's political meddling in the battle, and that they're also becoming increasingly disillusioned with some of the advice that President Zelensky has been getting from British and American military advisers. The last I want to stress is a rumour. It's obviously not corroborated. It's a plausible rumour, as I've discussed before, but again, we can't really confirm whether or not it's true. There's also a rumour, and I want to stress, this is again a rumour, that the Ukrainian military command has now formally asked President Zelensky to withdraw the Ukrainian troops from Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. Now, if that is true, it would be a logical thing to do. These two cities are undefendable. But I also have to say, it may be too late. It seems to me that the Russians and their militia forces now control all the road links and, uh, uh, to Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. And the Ukrainian troops encircled in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, and the guesstimates as to their number vary between 10 and 15,000, some put it higher, 17,000. They would have to fight their way out, and one does wonder whether they'd be able to, uh, all the more so as counteroffensives by the Ukrainian army to try to break through to them seem to have been consistently unsuccessful. So a retreat that might have been possible 
had it been undertaken two or three weeks ago when the writing was already on the wall for these soldiers may not be possible now. But anyway, I don't know for a fact that the Ukrainian army is advising, is giving this advice to President Zelensky. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. But if it is indeed the case that Ukrainian resistance in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk is crumbling, then that points to a faster collapse of Ukrainian resistance in northern Donbass than I had reckoned with, and reckoned on. And if that is also correct, then one does wonder whether uh, that will have that will create a chain reaction, and whether we'll start to see a further collapse across the rest of Donbass. Anyway, that's where we are in terms of Donbass at the moment. I I have to add also that there are now clear indications there was I was discussing this again in my previous video but now I think it is essentially confirmed that the famous Ukrainian counteroffensive in northeast Kharkiv is now going into reverse the point which the furthest point that this counteroffensive reached was a village on the Ukrainian-Russian border. This is a Ukrainian village on the Ukrainian side of the border. It has now been recaptured by the Russians. And there are growing indications that the Russians are now forcing back the Ukrainian soldiers all the way back, possibly, to Kharkiv. So that supposed successful offensive appears to be unravelling. And again, we're getting reports that apparently the Ukrainian military leadership, and I want to stress these are again unconfirmed reports, that the Ukrainian military leadership in Kiev apparently counseled against this offensive, that the uh, offensive was ordered by Zelensky at the insistence of the British and American advisers, and that the Ukrainian military leadership advised against it, that they are supposedly saying that these British and American advisers don't understand the nature of the battle or of the way in which the Russians fight and conduct war, and that, in fact, this is now supposedly another point of contention between those British and American advisers and the Ukrainian military leadership and Zelensky himself. Now, I've discussed these rumours of dissension in Kiev at some length, even though, as I said, they are uncorroborated, because I'm starting to get the sense that there is more and more of this, more and more uh, dissension and recriminations starting to spread, and you're starting to see this in some Ukrainian commentaries. And I do wonder whether the fact that we're seeing recriminations in some of these Ukrainian commentaries may be, uh, along the lines of what I've just been saying, may be an indication that these reports of dissension within the higher leadership in Kiev, whether these aren't starting to filter their way down through the, co the, the command chains and the political leadership, and whether they aren't being picked up by other people in Ukraine. Now, I have to stre I stress, this is all uncorroborated at the moment. If it is true, if such dissension is indeed taking place, by the way, then given the pace and direction of events, I think it can only be a matter of time before all this bursts into the open. Now, I'm going to add just a few quick further observations here which is that the media in the West, which up till fairly recently has been talking about one Ukrainian triumph after another, has gone increasingly silent about the events of the war. I, I was looking at the British media today. There was an unreported, uncorroborated report of President Putin having sacked a Russian general, which is supposedly proof 
are that the Russian campaign is not going according to plan. There is some ridiculing of the fact that the Russians have used a laser weapon to knock out a drone in um, Ukraine. I'm not quite sure why this is ridiculed in the way that it is. There's lots of general talk about Russian errors and Russian mistakes in Ukraine. But it's striking that as to the actual details of what's actually going on in the battlefield, the um, rumour, the, the, the reporting mill seems to be, at least at the moment, running dry. And I suspect that behind it all, there must be growing worries and concerns that things are not going quite in the triumphalist way that were being reported before. Well, all of this is taking place against a backdrop of growing recriminations about the oil and gas, uh, the, the failure of the oil and gas sanctions. It now does seem as if the European Union has essentially given up on the oil import ban idea. And there's also reports that the European Union is now largely given up on the idea of a seventh round of sanctions beyond the sixth round of sanctions, which is being negotiated and talked about at the moment, and which is un in severe trouble, facing severe trouble. So it could very well be that the sanctions drive has now run its course. We are also getting reports that, um, well, not reports, we have confirmation of a massive Russian expulsion of EU diplomats, which is apparently also causing dismay in European capitals. The Russians biding their time on this one. The Europeans ordered a mass expulsion of Russian diplomats um, about a week ago. Um, everybody was waiting with bated breath for what the Russians would do. The Russians didn't seem to be doing anything. I think that made people in European capitals think that this was all over. And then, of course, the hammer dropped and the Russians pressed ahead and expelled scores of EU diplomats. And there's been angry reactions about this in Western European capitals, as it's become clear that the Russians are not simply sitting back and allowing these expulsions to continue as they were. And um, I get the sense that the French in particular, France in particular, is particularly, the French government, is particularly disturbed about the number of French diplomats who have been expelled because um, they, um, President Macron may have persuaded himself that his attempts to try and keep some kind of dialogue going with President Putin, though I think it's a dialogue that the Russians are deeply unimpressed by, he may have thought that this dialogue would somehow protect the position of the French diplomats in Moscow. Well, clearly that's not proved to be the case. I would say that I have a personal interest in this because someone I know is a Greek diplomat posted in Russia, and I'm waiting to see whether he's going to be expelled as well. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say about those expulsions. The other big story is that it's beginning increasingly to look as if President Erdogan is serious about blocking uh, Sweden and Finland's entry into NATO. Now, there was going to be a NATO meeting to uh, um, approve the first steps towards Finland and Sweden joining NATO. Um, President Erdogan blocked it but he's been making more and more comments and his government have been making more and more comments to the effect that this is simply not going to happen. Finland and Sweden's joining NATO is simply not something that Turkey will agree. And perhaps more importantly and more significantly, President Erdogan seems to have the support of the entire Turkish political class and Turkish public opinion in opposing Finland's and Sweden's NATO membership bids. Now, I am going to still say, I, I am still think there's a possibility that what we're seeing is an elaborate um, bid, opening bid, 
in what could be a complicated negotiation and that it's still possible, or so it seems to me, that Finland and Sweden's NATO membership bids will eventually be approved. But I'm starting to think that President Erdogan is absolutely serious about this. And moreover, the sceptics are beginning to speak out across Europe. Uh, Matteo Salvini in Italy, and bear in mind he is an essential person supporting the Italian governing coalition. Matteo Salvini, the leader of the Italian right, the uh, Lega Nord, has come out and opposed the, uh, um, uh, NATO, the NATO applications by Sweden and Finland, and that may mean that Italian support for this cannot be taken for granted anymore. There's reports that the president of Croatia has spoken out against it also. It could be that this will start a chain reaction and we will see other states, perhaps Bulgaria, for example, where the government is coming under extreme pressure to change its policies, are basically supporting Ukraine, that we could perhaps start to see Bulgaria starting to change its position on this too, and perhaps, who knows, other EU governments, uh, NATO governments, conceivably even Hungary as well. So it could be that this NATO membership bid by Finland and Sweden might be about to unravel. Uh, the fact that the US government has apparently said that it will stand by Sweden and Finland may support that conclusion in the sense that why would the United States feel an obligation to say that if it thought that Sweden and Finland's memberships of NATO were now a done thing. What I'm going to say about that is this. If Finland's and Sweden's NATO membership bids are not approved, if they fail, then I strongly suspect that is going to provoke a political crisis in Finland, uh, in, in Finland and Sweden, in Helsinki, and Stockholm. Let me repeat again what I have said in the past. These two very inex these governments, led by two vet by inexperienced leaders, have pressed ahead with NATO membership applications, going against the long-standing traditions of neutrality of these countries. They pressed ahead with those NATO membership applications, compromising fatally the neutrality of these countries, but they will not have obtained the supposed benefits of NATO membership, of the protection that Article 5 of the Washington Treaty that set up NATO is supposed to provide. Now, that would leave Finland and Sweden in the worst of all worlds. And I can't help but think that if Finland and Sweden, if the publics in these two countries grasp, understand the false position their governments have brought them into, I can't help but wonder whether the, the publics in these two countries would insist on a change of government and whether any new governments that appear in these countries might decide that the priority now is to try to patch up some kind of relationship with Russia, um, given the extent of the damage to that relationship that has been done and the potential threat from Russia that these unwise NATO membership bids uh, will, uh, um, um, have caused. Well, we mustn't go too far ahead of ourselves. It's still possible that this will be resolved and that these NATO membership bids will eventually be approved. But what I'm going to say is this, and I want to repeat a point I made yesterday. What is astonishing about this affair is that these NATO membership bids by Finland and NATO were not first cleared with all NATO member states. 
it, it seems as if President Erdogan, who, let us remember, commands the second biggest army in NATO after that of the United States, was never consulted. He was never asked what his opinions would be about Finland and Sweden joining NATO. That is actually staggering, given what a difficult character President Erdogan is already known to be. It, it points again to unbelievable amateurism and disorganisation on the part of the State Department leadership in Washington and the NATO bureaucracy in Brussels. One would have thought that before Finland and Sweden were manoeuvred into making these NATO membership bids, an attempt would have been made to discuss this with the governments of all the NATO states, and certainly with President Erdogan, to make sure in advance that they were all in agreement. Quite obviously, and regardless of ha what happens, this was not done. Now, many months ago, or at least a long time ago, relative to this crisis, before this crisis began, I said that President Biden needed to change his foreign policy team. I said that people like Blinken, Secretary Blinken, and National Security Advisor Sullivan were manifestly not up to the job. I would add, by the way, that NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg is obviously, well, um, so obsessed with his ideologies and his um, um, feelings about Russia that he's not really up to the job either. Anyway, I said that these people were not up to the job, that they were amateurs and ideologues, and that they were leading the United States, and indeed NATO, as it turns out, into all kinds of problems, and that President Biden needed to sack them and to replace them with people who were frankly <laughs> far more confident, competent than these two people have been, than these people have been. Well, here you see another, another example of this. Blinken and Sullivan and other US officials, no doubt from the same class, all rushed ahead with this clever idea, this cunning plan, as they thought, of getting Finland and Sweden into NATO. A consolation prize, as I said, for the likely loss of NATO membership for Ukraine. And it's blown up in their face. Even if President Erdogan's objections can somehow be negotiated away, it's going, this, that's going to take time and effort to do which is not the impression that was needed at this time. And it is certainly, obviously, not a, 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 a further expenditure of energy and focus which needed to be concentrated on other things. The administration, this US administration, is extremely poorly led in terms of its foreign policy team. And here you see the proof. Well, there we are. That's enough for me today. Uh, there's much more to discuss. Economic pictures, picture across Europe is deteriorating rapidly. I'm going to be doing a program on locals in which I'm going to discuss President Putin's very interesting observations about the economic crisis in Europe. That's exclusive to locals. If you want to see that video, then please uh, look it up. Um, it'll be coming up in a few days. And in the meantime, as I said, that's me for the day. Um, thank you for joining me again. I look forward to you joining me again soon. Remember, you can pick us up. You can follow us on Locals and Rumble and other platforms. And on Locals, we have all this exclusive content that's appearing. And of course, I do my Wednesday live streams 
every Wednesday at 1400 hours Eastern Standard Time on Locals, which you can join if you choose to become an active member. And of course, if you're watching these programs on Rumble, then it's very easy to join us on Locals as well, because if you go to the top of the video, you will see a red maroon button there, which if you press, will take you directly to our Locals homepage, where you can join, join us on Locals as an active member, if you so choose. And of course, we're not only present on Locals and Rumble, we now have a thriving Telegram channel. We also have, um, we also of course have a presence in other platforms, the new free speech platform, Super U. We are also present on um, Odyssey and on other channels too. And of course, uh, you can support us if you wish via Patreon and subscribe star. You can go to our shop and buy the great things that you find there, our magic mugs, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our polo shirts, all these great things. And of course, don't forget, if you've liked this video, to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's enough for me today. For me today. Uh, thank you for joining me again. Look forward to seeing you again soon and have a very good day until then.